this in mind, let us get back to Gangadhareshwara of Kailashanatha Temple. Nirupama Raghavan generated the star maps of the 7th century AD and superimposed it on this Gangadhara. The map aligned perfectly with the image. Both the individual stars and the constellations matched. This picture is from Nirupama's research paper. There are traditional texts called Agamas which describe the rules for creating images of our gods. In these texts, Scientists have found clear correlation between the features of Ananda Tandava icon and the stars in the Orion constellation. The match was so dramatic that it looked like the authors had access to the accurate star positions of that century. Scientists have concluded that this Nataraja was created with a definite astronomical purpose of recording the Crab Supernova of 1054 AD. This image represents pralayam, the complete dissolution of creation. In the images of Nataraja and Ranganatha, we saw the creation of the universe. Nataraja suppressing chaos and bringing forth order with his dance. Ranganatha sleeping and dreaming up the universe. Contrast those with this image. Kali is standing with a severed head in her hand. She is also wearing a garland of decapitated heads and chopped up hands. Shiva himself is lying dead under her feet. It seems to be a condition where all laws of universe have broken down and there is complete annihilation. There is something dark, terrifying and inevitable about the image. To me, great art is like a great song. Even if you don't understand the notes that make it up, you can still appreciate it. And when you understand the notes, the intricacies, you can appreciate it even more. This Kali is such a masterful work of art. You can appreciate her at many levels. It took a really long time for me to crack the oracle. I gave up on her until someone recommended that I watch the second movie in the trilogy again. My moment of epiphany was this conversation between Neo and Oracle. You're not human, are you? If I had to guess, I'd say you're a program from the machine world. But if that's true, that could mean you are part of this system. Another kind of control. How can I trust you? This was a revelation to me. The fact that Oracle is a program and not a human being. It makes you wonder why Morpheus trusts her so much. When Neo asks the question, how can I trust you? This is what she says. The bad news is there's no way if you can really know whether I'm here to help you or not. So it's really up to you. Just have to make up your own damn mind to either accept what I'm going to tell you or reject it. Have you guessed the answer? Oracle represents the Vedas. When Neo meets Oracle for the first time, she points to a Latin quote hanging on her door. It said, Know thyself. This is the essence of what Vedanta asks the seekers to do. Know who you really are. That is the only way you can be liberated. In the famous conversation which Neo has with the architect, there are clues about the oracle and why she exists. That dialogue is a masterclass in nuance and perhaps the most discussed scene in the Matrix trilogy. The architect explains that human beings kept rejecting the matrix. Several versions of the matrix failed until they found that the only way to stabilize the matrix was to give human beings a free will, which enables them to choose their path. Choice. The problem is choice. And nearly 99% of all test subjects accepted the program as long as they were given a choice, even if they were only aware of the choice at a near unconscious level. That is why the matrix has a program that helps people who choose to escape the matrix. This description is a great fit for the Vedas. The world of Maya which keeps us trapped in this illusion also gives us the Vedas, a means to escape Maya if we choose to. It is uncanny how much quantum physics makes sense when viewed through the lens of Vedanta. 
If you have to really understand the depth of their resonance, we need to delve deeper into Vedanta. Nothing can happen and nothing can exist in the dream world without you witnessing it. The objects in your dream get their existence because you witness it. The very act of you seeing it brings things into existence in your dream, isn't it? Brahman and the universe have a similar relationship. Everything is born in Brahman, exists in Brahman and resolves in Brahman. But Brahman is not an active participant in the process. It is only the witness to the universe. That is why Brahman is referred to in Vedanta as Sakshi Chaitanyam, the witness consciousness. Compare this to what quantum physics is saying. A particle does not have any real existence until it is observed. Physical systems do not exist until you measure them. They come into existence because you observe them. How can you not see the obvious parallels? Is this not the Sakshi Chaitanyam, the witness consciousness that Vedanta speaks about? Can you see how this neatly explains the paradox of quantum physics? How is it possible for a puny observer in the laboratory to bring things into existence? It is possible because there is nothing puny about an observer. He is that all-pervading consciousness that brought the whole universe into existence. I want to end this post with these poignant words from Einstein which seems to echo all the great sages of our antiquity. A human being experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest of the universe, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole nature in its beauty. It is among the earliest cave temples of South India. It has a magnificent sculpture of Shiva as Gangadhara. The most fascinating of these inscriptions are the ones on either side of Gangadhara. It is a series of Sanskrit couplets composed by the king himself. The verses have multiple layers of meanings. At one level, it reads like a poem in praise of Lord Shiva and at another level, it reads like the praise of the king himself. There is a beautiful description of Calvary as a lady wearing a garland of gardens pleasing to the eye and possessing attractive qualities. You can almost visualize the King Mahendra Varman standing on this ancient rock and looking down at Kaveri, curving around the plains, lush with greenery and majestic temples on her banks and instantly falling in love with her. Also observe how the temple poem and the image seamlessly emerges from the landscape. This temple should not be seen as a standalone entity separated from its surroundings. It is part of the surrounding nature. Like Shiva emerges from the rock of the Elephanta caves, this temple too emerges from the rock, the river and the trees that surround it. A natural consequence of the beauty and divinity that already exists in this place that has only been unveiled by the artists.